Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Chris, for that uh, introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I am a passionate educator, and uh, we actually don't, our life circumstances often inform the paths that we go along, and mine are, are uh, my life circumstances are, are no different than anybody else's. I've been very open with students that I've had, but I've never really come out and, and uh, strongly publicly said, talked about the issues that I've had. But as much as my lessons when I was in school were really wonderful and really valuable, there was always an aspect of my playing that was not quite where everything was, and that was my soft high playing. And I could say that uh, it was inconsistent. Uh, some days it was there and some days it wasn't, but I went on to win a position in the Pittsburgh Symphony and then in the, in the New York Philharmonic. But around 2002, uh, I started to experience uh, significant trouble with that, where it became, rather than being an inconsistent issue, it really became a liability, which is a problem if you're an associate principal trombone because you need to play pieces that are soft and high, you know? The principal is out there playing a lot of the big, the bigger rep, but when things like Brahms 1 come along, you know, I might be on stage for that. And when I can't do that, that's a problem. And I actually, uh, it, it caused me to reconsider. Many of you know, may, may know, that I went back to Juilliard for my undergraduate and graduate degrees. What you don't know is that my original intention was to go back on organ. I am an organist, and I had gotten back into organ playing around that time. And uh, it would have been my intention, if it had worked out with the scheduling, for me to get my organ degree and potentially leave the Philharmonic and become a full-time organist. That would not have worked out. And so I went to Juilliard, and I plowed through and managed to get through some psychological issues, but never really resolved it until 2006. And in 2006, I was working with a particular student. He was someone who'd come in for a couple lessons, and I was helping him through uh, an amateur change. He had, uh, bottom line is his, his issues were significant, and I offered him some advice. And when I went downstairs later that day, I, uh, I looked at myself in the mirror, because I was always very observant to this, and I, I looked at myself and said, hmm, I'm not following my own advice here. What happens if I make this little change? And I made this little change, and all of a sudden, everything soft and high happened perfectly. It also happened to coincide when I had, just within that last month, made the decision that I was going to actively pursue, uh, to the best of my ability, trying to get the bass trombone position So, uh, in the Philharmonic. So here I am in 2006, I'm saying, great, I want to be a bass trombonist, and now I can play soft and high. <laughs> so. But it led me to the question, as much as I, I, I didn't necessarily actively seek help, but I certainly got lots of counsel over that period from a lot of different people, and no one was really able to help me. And even more so, what I wound up frustrated with was I wasn't able to help myself. And I said, why can't I help myself? Why couldn't I help myself through this issue? And that question of why began a journey, which I'm really only just beginning now and I'm 11 years into it, this question of why, but it's a question I want to pose to you, and it is now that dirty little word, why, in classical music circles, in music circles in general. You see, if you go to law school, and you're in a class, and you ask a professor, hey, professor, I, I understand what you're talking about, that law here, but, but why does it apply there and not here? If a professor, would a professor respond, well, because I said so. Why are you questioning my authority? And yet we accept that as maybe part of the norm in our musical studies. Or how about med school where you go to a doctor, where you've got a doctor professor, and you say to the doctor, hey, professor, I don't understand why this is happening. And the professor says, well, you know, you don't want to overthink too much because, well, my professor studied with this guy, studied with this guy, studied with this guy, and he goes back to Hippocrates, and we don't contradict Hippocrates. The reality is, we need to ask the question why. Because when we start to develop, when good ideas, when good theories become dogma, then we wind up in trouble. And so with this discussion, I'm actually planning on hitting, leaving a lot of time for questions and answers, either at the end or if you have questions about things that I bring up specifically, feel free to ask away. There's actually a microphone right there on the stage left, and if you have a question, feel free to come on up. Please come on up so that the people who might be watching on the webcast can hear your question. If you don't, I'll simply repeat the question. So, uh, we're going to address 
a few points that we look at as trombonists, but even particularly, even more so as brass players, and look at it through the lens of why. Why are we suggesting this advice? So the first thing is, I'm just going to go sort of chronologically with, with how we approach playing the instrument. What's the first thing we do when we go to play? We pick up the horn, right? That's the very first thing that we do. So the first question is, how many of you have ever worked with, either worked with a student on slide technique or been a student and had your slide technique worked on? Raise your hand. So many of you. That's fantastic. Now, let's look at why we work on slide technique. Why do we work on slide technique? Well, what is the point in learning how to play an instrument and working on it? The point is to make things as easy and effortless as possible, right? To get out of your own way, to allow your body to work. So, bear with me here. Everybody stand up for a moment. Now, put your, right, put your arms down at your sides. And we're going to go sort of the dark side. We're going to pretend we play trumpet for a second. And we're going to put our two hands up, and we're going to bring them up like this, like you play trumpet, right? Put them back down. Put them back up. All right, drop your left hand. Simon says, drop your left hand. Look at your right hand. What's the position of the top of your right hand? You notice how the top of your hand is vertical? Right. Now, we are going to introduce the person who's in front of you, and you're going to say, introducing the person who's in front of me, and we're going to go, and ta-da! Everybody do that. Ready? Together. Ta-da! Right? Look at your hands. Drop your left hand. Look at your right hand. What's the position of your right hand? The palm, top of the hand is vertical. Everybody can sit back down. When our arm moves, we have three bones in our arm. I'm not going to be too technical here, but they're the humerus, and then in the lower arm, we've got the radius and the ulna, and they're designed to rotate so that when we bring our hand at our side naturally this way, and it comes up, it naturally, at rest, without any kind of muscle tension, wants to be positioned here. And then when we go out to what we would say six or seven position, our hand naturally wants to do this. And why is this important? Well, it's really important because if we start to talk about how we hold the slide, our slide grip needs to allow that to happen. And sometimes we'll wind up telling our students or being told ourselves, you need to hold your slide between your three fingers and you need to keep it like this at all times. Well, which is great for if you're in seventh position this way, but if you're like this in first position, well, how does that position your hand? Put your hands up in front of your faces like this, and now keep that same position and put it down, and we wind up with our arm like this. Do you feel the tension when your arm is rotated this way? Do you feel that in your forearm? Now release it. Now let's do the opposite. Let's say we want to allow ourselves to have our, uh, to have our hand like this in first position, and so we hold the slide in a way that maybe has one finger, and let's go out to seventh position. Boom. And now put it down. You feel the tension that's in your arm in order to keep your hand like this? We let it go. So when I approach how we hold the slide, it's simply to allow that natural motion to happen. And what does that mean? It's really simple. Slide, hand, boom. And in this position, in this position here, my fingers are slightly on top of each other, and when I go out, it allows my hand to ro rotate. And you'll see when I pick up my horn. From here, in first position, seventh position. The idea is for the motion to be completely natural. So when we teach slide technique, we want to allow that to happen. That's an important part of what we do as trombonists. So now that we can hold the instrument, we get to the next part of what we do, which is Breathing, we take a breath. Now, I'm gonna approach this from two different kinds of breaths that we take. There are two, largely two kinds of breaths that we take. There's the breath that we take in the middle of a phrase, like when you're playing a Bodoni, and there's a breath that you take at the beginning of a, of a phrase, your initial breath. So, we're gonna address that breath that we take in the middle of a phrase first. So what is the goal of that kind of breath? What is the goal of the breath in the middle of a phrase? Well, the goal is to get the maximum amount of air in the minimum amount of time, right? It's to try to fill up as much as possible. And we all acknowledge, there's wide acknowledgement that we wanted, that we understand that the way you'll fill up, the way you'll get the maximum amount of air in is by having the most 
open space, right? Water flows through a wider tube faster than it throw, flows through a narrow tube. And we acknowledge that. And so what do we do? Well, we want to put our mouths and our throats in the position of the most open sound, the most open vowel sound in language, which, as everybody knows, the most open vowel sound in language is O, oh, except it isn't. When you go to the doctor, what does he say? Exactly. The doctor says, say, ah. And you, I know you're sitting there thinking, well, wait a second. How, do, how does this jive? Listen, when we say ah, look at what happens. Our mouth opens up, but also our tongue comes down. And so our mouth becomes shaped sort of like a funnel. Like, let's say the word, say the vowel sounds. First go, oh, and then slur, like a glissando, oh, ah. Oh, ah. Do it again. Oh, ah. Do you feel the back of your tongue go down? When we do that, when we say ah, uh, it turns our mouth into more of a funnel shape. Whereas when we say oh, in order to get that oh sound, we actually have to constrict our throat. I know you're sitting there saying, oh, wait, wait a second. Wait, I don't understand, Jim. I thought that when we go with a nice O oh sound, we get that nice deep sound like Whereas an ah breath goes, and it's much higher pitched, and we want the deeper, we want the lower pitch. Well, you know, in a world or in a universe where we, by the way you, low, the way you make everything more relaxed is by deepening the pitch, the way you, you uh, slow down air or get more volume is by, deep, by uh, deepening the pitch, that would be true. Except, how do we make a lower note? How do we get a lower pitch on a tube? It's just physics with a longer tube, right? A longer tube makes a deeper pitch. So when we go, why are we getting that deep pitch? Because we're constricting our throat, so it's more like a paper towel tube, more like a straw, a flexi straw. Whereas when we say, ah, we're actually opening our, we're, we're lowering our tongue, we're making our shape more like a funnel, and we're actually making a very short space between the back of the throat and where the, where the air goes into the trachea. Now, I know you're probably saying, well, isn't this just semantics? Why does this matter O versus ah? Why is this important? I'll tell you why it's important. There's another thing that O versus ah does. By constricting the throat, we often need to wind up making up for it by really opening our mouths in what I might call a guppy position. And it looks like this. Do you see that? Do you see what I did, what happened with my jaw? Or if I really pull it back and really go, oh. Do you see how inefficient that is? How much I have to move my lip out of the mouthpiece? I practically have to pull my lip out of the mouthpiece. And then after I breathe, after I finish breathing, that all has to come in. The jaw has to come back up. The lips have to come together. And all that has to get ready to play a note. Whereas when we say an ah breath, everything stays much more stable. One more time. It's a simpler, less adulterated breath. Now, the last question that people might have about this is, well, listen, let, let's talk about this. When we talk about the O breath, what we're talking about is nice, warm air. And especially with our younger students, we're trying to get them to have warm sounds, to avoid bright, brilliant sounds. And I get that. I get that we're after helping our younger players, especially, warm up their sounds. But I would encourage you, I think we can find a better illustration than one which causes you to actively engage muscles that you don't want to be engaged because they're going to constrict the way we play. There are other avenues for making that happen. So the second breath that we take is the initial intake breath, that breath that we take when we initially start something up. And there are two ideas I want to look at really quickly here. The first is 
the idea of since you have time at the beginning, you should take an expansive amount of time to breathe. Sort of like, you know, if you have four, four beats, take four beats to breathe because you will get a bigger breath in than you will if you take one beat to breathe. And the other is the idea of a circular breath. A circular breath is where you breathe in and then you breathe out. So you go, oh, sorry. Now, and there are issues with each of these. First of all, when we, what happens when we breathe? Well, what does physiology tell us? Physiology tells us, and this is no, no secret, that our body naturally at rest, when we're in a, a, uh, a tension neutral position, our lungs are about 50% full. At 50% full, you have to start using abdominal muscles and your, di and your uh, not your diaphragm, your abdominal muscles in order to help expel the air. You use the intercostal pressure to help expel the air. That when you get above 50%, now your body's under tension. And your body's under tension because it wants the air to come out. So when we breathe over four beats, what are we doing? It's like taking, you, you, know, you know your breath, you're gonna, it's gonna take a certain amount of effort to breathe in because of the intercostal pressure that's created. So it's like taking a weight and saying, well, I want to reduce the amount of tension that I'm under the weight, so I'm gonna pick it up and I'm going to go one, two, three, four, um. And that that's gonna be somehow easier than going one, two, three, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It doesn't make it more relaxed. If we also lived in a world where by taking more time you could somehow increase the size of your lungs and get more air in, I'd be all for it. But our lungs are a given size. Whether you breathe over one beat, two beats, three beats, four beats, or eight beats, you're not going to get any more air than you can fit into your lungs. It just doesn't happen. So we can look at the analogy of, you know, a, a natural breath is one sort of like, well, uh, we're going to look at, a, at the example of a tennis player. When a tennis player gets ready to strike the ball, what do they do? Do they come back? Do they, they're sitting there, the, 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 the opponent here, the opponent's getting ready to serve the ball. And they get down like this and they're ready to go. And their opponent's bouncing the ball and then they go, one, two, three, four, bam! No! What is the breath? What, what is there? What is their backswing? Their backswing is a reaction to the attempt of striking the ball. What is our breath? Our breath is a reaction to the attempt to strike a note. And this is really, really key. And if you watch people, whether they take time, really established players, there are really good, fine, established players out there who take time. And if you ever watch them take time, you know what you also see them do? Count. That there's a rhythm to it. They go one, two, three, four, play. And too many of us look at that initial breath as going, and it's amorphous. So that's the first point. The second idea is the circular breath. And let's look at that tennis player analogy as well again for the circular breath. The idea is that once the breath goes in, the air should come out. Which sounds like a good idea. Why the tennis player? Once again, we're going to use that analogy. The breath is the reaction to the action of starting striking the note, right? So that tennis player comes back, and they're ready to go. Have they struck the ball yet? No. Have they struck the ball? Have they struck the ball? Have they struck the ball? Here, they strike the ball. What are they doing between here and here? They're building up energy. They're building up momentum. They're building up the force that they actually need to strike the ball with momentum. And we do the exact same things when we play. Because what happens after you breathe? After you breathe, you breathe in, and then we have to put our lips together. We have to get our tongue in position. We have to pre-pressurize the air, otherwise we get that amorphous, like a bagpipe. You ever what, hear a beginning bad piper play? Well, when I lived in New York, yeah, in New York you see all sorts of things. When I was, lived in New York, I would let out the dog. When I'd go to the dog letting out area, there was a guy. He was just learning how to play bagpipes, sitting in the park. And, you know, he was just learning to play. You know how you could turn, learn how I knew he was just learning to play? We don't do that when we play. We pre-pressurize the air. So when we play, there's actually a natural pause. And if you have any doubts about this, take any given note that you want and take a given tempo 
and videotape yourself. Videotape yourself and play it eight times, 10 times, 20 times. After you get through that first breath, whatever you do, after you get through that first breath, you're going to wind up going, you're going to see later on something along the lines of one, two, three, dum, dum. And you hear that little pause? That little pause is a natural part of the breathing cycle. It's a natural part of the playing cycle. So now we've covered breathing, the initial attack. Ah, now I get to something that's really, really um, not often talked about. Note releases. How we release notes. Now, we don't often talk about note releases because we don't understand it. But once again, there's a certain logic to this. There are three ways to release a note. The first way is with the tongue, called a tongue stop. We all know what that sounds like, but I'll do it for you. And I'm sorry, when I say releasing notes, I'm talking about repeated articulated notes. Say 16th notes that say, you know, 80 beats a minute or 100 beats a minute. And so this is a tongue stop in that version. Generally, in musical circles, that's frowned upon. Okay, we, we actually use a tongue stop for sometimes things in Bartok and Miraculous Mandarin and other, other pieces there might be licks that we use a tongue stop for. But generally speaking, that's looked down upon. The other way, the second way to release a note is to simply release the intercostal pressure that's on the air, to release the air pressure, like a bagpiper going, rah, 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 and it looks like this. Now, I exaggerated that for, with the intention so that you could see it, but oftentimes you'll see either in your students or in yourselves, you'll see your arms going up and down when you play those notes. Does anyone have that issue? Some people do. Now, so what's the third way we can release a note? If we don't want tongue stops and we don't want to release that, and by the way, it brings up a point that, that I think it's important to mention. As teachers, we say, in repeated staccato notes, keep the air going. Keep the air going. And I use that phrase, keep the air going. What does it mean? Well, Let's look at what it doesn't mean. If we want a note followed by a space, let's, let me go backwards one. We all acknowledge that when you put air between your lips, you will get a vibration, you'll get a sound, right? When air goes through the embouchure, you'll get a sound. So it stands to reason that if you don't get a sound, you didn't put air through the embouchure. Makes sense, logical statement. If A equals B, then if not B, then not A. All right, so then we get to if that's understood, then when we look at repeated notes, what do we have? We have a note followed by a space, followed by a note, followed by a space, followed by a note, followed by a space. All right. So we understand what that sounds like, that that's generally a good attack. Well, how do we get there? Well, that space, no air is going through. But yet we have this phrase that says, keep the air going. What do we mean? We mean keep the air pressure going. Keep the air pressure consistent. And how do we keep the air pressure consistent? How many of you have heard of the glottis or a glottal stop? Some of you. How many of you have heard of it in a positive sense? Nobody. How many have heard of you? How many of you have heard of it in a negative sense? A lot of people. Guess what, folks? It's part of playing. And it's something that I teach. It's an important part of playing. If you want to release notes clearly, we use a glottal stop. Now, what is a glottal stop? What is a glottis? Well, if the aperture is the opening that's created in between the lips when you play a note, the glottis is the opening that's created in between the vocal cords, or in between, I should say, actually, the vocal folds when air goes through. The glottis constantly changes. It has constant in uh, constant when we make different kinds of speech. There, are, there are constant shifting of it. However, we use it for certain things, like when you cough. We go <coughs> when we actually um, you know, when we go to the bathroom. We use it, and it actually it, it, it's part of the Valsalva maneuver where you actually lock yourself up to create intercostal pressure. But folks, it's logic here. If you don't want to tongue stop a note, and we know that tongue stopping is no good, generally, and if we don't 
And if we all acknowledge that we don't want to actively release the pressure that's in our body cavity, then there's only one other option, and that is a glottal stop. It's just logic. And I would like for it to be an opinion, arguable, but that's what we have available to us. So what does it sound like if we use that, if I take the tongue away? And actually, actually, how many of you whistle? Good. Can we all whistle an F? Just go. Oh, good. Theme and variations on F. I love it in a trombone crowd. Okay. Now, can you articulate? Can you can you do those repeated notes with a whistle? Go together. Here we go. And uh, um. Do you feel in your chest? Do you feel that little hitch? Do it again. That, folks, is a glottal stop. You are using your glottis to stop the air, to keep the air pressure inside your chest consistent. And that's an important part of releasing notes. So why do I bring it up here? Because it's not something to avoid. It's not something to try to get rid of. It's something that's actually a natural part of playing and a natural part of releasing. Now, is it possible for it to be turned into a negative? Absolutely. It absolutely can. In fact, sometimes circular breathing has a wonderful way of making that into a problem because we get locked up. We don't allow ourselves the natural time to pressurize. And instead, because we know that we have to pressurize, that just has to happen. What we wind up doing is instead getting locked up. So this. becomes this. Because we know something has to happen. All right, food for thought. Uh, there's gonna be plenty of time for questions. Um, next thing I want to bring up is, uh, is, okay, now that we've hit breathing, I'd be remiss if I didn't hit buzzing. Now here's where I think we have it's kind of sad where we are as a trombone community because we kind of, there's one camp that says, oh, you should buzz everything all the time and it's, it's silly not to buzz. Another camp that says, why in the world would you buzz because you know, it has nothing to do with the instrument. And, and uh, so let's look at what buzzing actually is. Let's look at how we make a sound, all right? One of those camps places too much importance on the vibration. And the other camp places too little importance on the vibration. When we make a note, right? Let's look at, let's look at uh, the idea that the, the buzz is extremely important because the mouthpiece is a microphone and the horn is an amplifier. Well, if that were the case, if the mouthpiece were a microphone and the horn is an amplifier, then if I, it doesn't matter what pitch I buzz into the instrument, it would sound great. But if I buzz an E in first position, what's it gonna sound like? Yeah, it roughly amplified the buzz. And you know what? When you do that, it feels really weird. Your embouchure feels really awful. Well, you know what? That's because the instrument is a resonator. Physics says that this instrument of a given length will allow certain frequencies to go through the instrument. And that only frequencies that are in, uh, that are in tandem, that are basically within the instrument, only those frequencies will actually be able to resonate within it. And so we actually have to buzz an F in first position. And when we get that feeling of what it feels like when we buzz the E in first position, that really weird feeling in our face, that's actually very much the feeling that we have in the mouthpiece, but we don't recognize it because the instrument's not there. It's similar. Now, so buzzing isn't all important because, uh, no, yeah, oh, what is it? No, the, uh, yeah, where was I going with this? Gosh darn it, I lost my, I, I lost how I was dealing with this. Um, so, yeah, the instrument actually resonates, so buzzing isn't all important. But buzzing, for that very reason, buzzing is important. And why is buzzing important? Because it matters what note we actually vibrate in the mouthpiece. Because if I buzz an E in the instrument, what am I going to get? An E. 
and it doesn't matter where I put it. So buzzing is important. So what can we take away from this? What can we learn from this? How can we apply this? And I'm going to like to use the analogy here of, of a baseball pitcher. The motions that we put into playing an instrument are very, very refined. We've got very specific muscles, specific muscle groups, whether it be in our throat, whether it be in our mouth, whether it be in our lips and our amishers. Very specific patterns are learned. And just like the specific patterns that a young baseball pitcher will learn when they pitch. And so what can we take from this? Well, when you've got a, a fourth grade, a fifth grade, a sixth grade pitcher, you know, they're, they're just kind of getting the feel for what it's like to throw a baseball. Their throwing motion isn't particularly refined. They're throwing the ball, you know, maybe 35, 40 miles an hour. It's not that big a deal. They throw footballs, they throw grapefruit, whatever, right? And same with our younger players. Our younger players need to learn how to buzz because buzzing is integral to the instrument. Now, this is the way I'm looking at that information. And so I, dig I digress from the, uh, this, is, this is now more a philosophical approach and less of a, you know, a sort of logical, rational approach. Well, it's still rational because I'm using the data to sort of come, come conclusions, but these are my conclusions. When a pitcher starts to become more advanced, their throwing motion becomes more refined. It becomes more and more important that they try to remain only throwing, well, throwing baseballs, and that that very specific motion is reserved just for baseballs. And if you would have a major league pitcher, I imagine their coach, if the major league pitcher said, hey, coach, how, do you, how would you feel if I started throwing grapefruit? I want to get stronger. I can guarantee the coach is going to say, are you nuts? What do you want to mess with your mechanics? Now, I think there's a certain amount, when I deal with my advanced students who have really advanced tone production, in terms of buzzing, buzzing is something that I shy away from for them because their mechanics are very well rooted in playing the instrument. And I can go anecdotally with my own experience, and my experience is not like everybody's experience, but I can tell you that five or 10 minutes of mouthpiece buzzing, and I would feel different on the instrument. Not better, not worse, just different. And so my thought is, sometimes difference is a good thing, but in that particular situation, it's something I like to try to shy away from. But I absolutely encourage my younger players, especially high school kids, to do it. The more advanced they are, the less buzzing I incorporate. Does it still have value? Absolutely. Absolutely. If a player has a technical passage that they're having trouble getting through, maybe one of the reasons is you're not actually vibrating the pitches clearly. So we can pull off the mouthpiece and we can try. But there are other techniques that I have with my students to help try to get them through those things without uh, going the route of mouthpiece buzzing. Now, there are, my page keeps flipping back here. Ah, all right, two last two points. One is shifting in the low register. And our solution to this is if we start to look at what actually happens with our embouchures and with our apertures specifically, you know, the question is to shift or not to shift. Is a shift a good thing? Is a shift a bad thing? Or is a shift just is? Well, here's the answer. As we go higher, our apertures naturally get smaller, right? And as we go lower, our apertures get larger. And I think we pretty much all acknowledge those things. Not only does that happen, but our lip position changes. When I play a high B flat, my top lip or my bottom lip is fairly behind my top lip. When I go to a middle B flat, it starts to come out more. You see? No, it's less it's less behind the top lip. Low B flat. You see how I'm more even here? Pedal B flat. Now it's really turning out. And the lower I go, the more that lip turns out. So grab this. I go lower, the lip turns out more. 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 Have you spotted the problem with this yet? We have finite amount of room inside the mouthpiece. It's not unlimited room. And I can keep wanting to turn my lip in all I want, but there's going to come a time when my bottom lip starts to interfere with my top lip like this.
and the notes just won't speak. But by making an alteration and by flattening out my bottom lip, so now instead of going forward, it's more even and it's flatter, I get this. So the question is, to shift or not to shift, it's more a question of, do you have the room to vibrate? If you are blessed with really, really thin lips, and you can get your lips into the mouthpiece down to a double pedal B flat without changing anything, God bless you. <laughs> I wish I were you, but I'm not. I got fleshy lips, and you know what? I've got to make what I have work. And in order for what I have to work, I have to change because I can't just keep putting flesh in a limited amount of space. And for some people, that means shifting this way, shifting, eventually bringing the mouthpiece up towards their nose like I do. Well, well yeah, it works most of the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and for some people, it means going the other way. It means going down, 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 until they're practically pulling their top lip out of the mouthpiece. But I don't think there's any question that for some people, it's just an imperative. And it's not a matter of, you know, if I didn't shift, I could not shift for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. There's no amount of learning that I'm going to have that's going to make my muscles work better if they're just running out of room. All right, last point. Ah, Bass trombone sound concept. And I only bring this up because it's a little bit of pet peeve of mine. Um, there's a thought that the bass trombone is a completely different instrument, requires a completely different sound and a completely different approach. And there's certainly value in the fact that it definitely plays a different role. But if we look at some other things, um, and first of all, if you look at alto trombone, you know what the average bore size of an alto trombone roughly is? It's about 500 or so, 500. And symphonic bore tenor trombone is 547. Well, when we give, when a young tenor trombonist learns alto trombone, we say, all right, here's an alto trombone. It's pitched in E flat. You gotta play some scales, you know, and maybe we'll play some Blazevich, some of the easier Blazevich cleft studies, and then here, learn a piece, go learn alto. And yet there's some, for whatever reason, some recommend some uh, some recommendation among bass trombonists, and, and I actually heard this that you know people spend years cultivating their sound on bass trombone. I, I actually got it when I was auditioning for the Philharmonic, and someone asked me, you know, Jim, you have to just ask yourself, do you really think you're going to be competitive here? People spend years cultivating their sound. That was the term, cultivating their sound. And here are my thoughts on that. If an alto trombone is pitched at five, is is a uh, bore size of 500 on average, and a tenor trombone is 547. And an alto trombone is an E-flat. It stands to reason that the difference between a bass trombone and a tenor trombone would be much more than that, right? Bass trombone bore size is 562. 15 thousandths of an inch. Dual bore slide, 578 and 562 is an average of 570. 570, yeah, 570. That's 23 thousandths of an inch. That's half, half the difference between alto and tenor. And it's pitched in the same key. It's not like it's contrabassoon, folks. <laughs> you know? So I'm not trying to diminish the challenges that playing bass trombone has. We definitely have to have a fluidity in the register. And as everybody knows, I mean, the bass trombone, just because of the valves, is a superior instrument to the tenor trombone. We can hit all the notes. <laughs> but every great sound, sound concept, one word about sound, just in general, Every great sound, not every great, great brass sound, not every great string sound, every great sound period has three key parts to it. You've got a certain amount of warmth, you've got core, and then you've got brilliance. And too often, bass trombone is in an effort to go warm. We avoid the core and we avoid the brilliance. And when we actually look at what the instrument is designed to do, it's not designed to be that different from a tenor trombone. Now, if someone wishes to design it to be different from a tenor trombone and make a bass trombone with a bore size of 625, they can do that, and then we're having a different conversation here, but we're not. So allow it to do what it's designed to do, which is to have breadth, to have body, but also to have 
brilliance and also to have core and to match with the rest of the instruments in the brass section because good tuba players get brilliance. It's only the bad ones that don't. And why would we want to sound like a bad tuba player? <laughs> All right, so that's the end of my conversation. I've got this microphone here, right here. And if you don't want to go to the microphone and you just want to announce any questions from out there, I welcome it. I'll repeat the question, but I do ask for your questions. I've hit a lot of topics, and I know said a lot of things that probably go outside uh, the conventions of what we understand as far as pedagogy. I welcome your questions and I welcome your challenges. I'm, I'm here to learn just as I'm here to teach. Come on up. Hi. Um, so you didn't talk about the endings of notes without a note following. Have you um, thought about it to the same depth of scientifically? I think that's a good question, and I do think we probably incorporate it. I mean, I think it really matter. It really depends on the situation. What kind of a release are we going for? When I do a release for, say, Mahler 3, am I glottal stopping? I don't know. <laughs> In that case, I am. But do I have to release that way? What if I don't release that way? That sounds good, too. It just depends on what you want to do. So does it have to be a glottal stop to release a single note? No, I don't think it does. But I think it's a tool that we want to have at our disposal. And certainly we've had conductors, we actually call it the kind of release, we call it a Gatti release. Because Daniele Gatti came in and wanted our releases to go, bah. and you hear what I did with my voice just there? It went, bah. that is a glottal stop. So, and we use that. When he's there, we do it. And actually, when he's not there, we'll say, hey, should we put a Gatti stop in? And yeah, sure, why not? Or maybe no. I, it really depends. Good question. Yeah. You talked about core, warmth, and brilliance as if it's one spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if you're working on somebody's sound, how might you move in one direction or, or another? Okay, the question is, I talked about core, warmth, and brilliance like it's on a spectrum. And if I'm working on someone's sound, how would I approach it? The way I describe it, I describe it as the sound pyramid in that some people, everyone has, everyone, every well-established player has a pyramid of a certain shape. You know, but Joe Alessi's sound pyramid is very different from Christian Lindbergh's sound pyramid. You know, but they, both of them, each of them has warmth and core and brilliance. It really depends on the player. If I've got a player who has a very bright sound and lacks warmth, I'm going to encourage them to actually relax on the inside here and to try to let things go and to let the air flow through, to try to let the air flow through faster with a higher volume of air. I'll say your air right now is seeing your sound is very thin. You don't have any warmth and you lack warmth because you're so tight on the inside that the air is going through a little straw. I want you to make that straw larger, so instead of going, you're going, and frequently that will help. If it's a player with a lot of warmth, but without a whole lot of brilliance, I'll tell them, listen, you just sound, it sounds like you're, the way I describe it, it sounds like your aperture is very wide, like you're using a very wide aperture, sort of, um, oh my gosh, I could, I could talk about, give my little spiel about apertures, and maybe that'll, that'll present itself, but, um, I'll say you sound very wide. You actually need to bring your aperture in a little bit. And you need to move a higher volume of air, a much higher speed of air, because you're moving your air too slowly. And you're getting that kind of eh, kind of sound that some that that is not uncommon in the bass trombone world, the kind of sound that like like this. It's kind of saggy. Now, there are a couple issues with that, one of which is I'm not actually centering the note very, very well. Actually, Andrew Glendening um, has a book um, that where he talks about center. He discussed it in his lecture yesterday over in Minor. Very good uh, analogy. I'm really under the center of the note. But the larger issue 
just as much as that I'm moving my air in a very kind of slow, uh, slow, amorphous way, and I'm not actually moving with any speed. And frequently when I, ask, when I encourage students to move a high volume of air at good speed, that what we actually need is wind, usually that sound opens up from the first to the a higher quality sound, from And we get more of those middle or more of those uh, middle tones, and we get more of those more of that brilliance. That's a really good question. Oh, we got somebody walking up for a question. Thank you. Hello, this is on. This is good. Okay. Um, so I've had lockup issues for twelve years, and it's on and off. And this is the first time I'm hearing someone talk about the glottis and the Valsalva maneuver in a good way. Now I'm curious, has, have any, has anybody come to you with lockup issues? Um, and I'm curious, if so, how have you talked them through it? That's a very good question. Um, I have worked with a couple players with lockup issues. And it's, I've experienced a certain amount of success. The way I've dealt with it is, first of all, getting people to just, to get rid of, the bottom line is I don't have a great answer for that yet. As I said, I'm still on my own journey to learn this, and I actually learned a lot from, from Andrew's class yesterday, and uh, I'm taking some of that with me to, to figure out, especially the idea of strangeness, and strangeness, which he borrowed from uh, and he acknowledged with, with Arnold Jacobs, I think is a way that I would approach it, and especially after hearing that lecture. The way I would approach it now would be, most people that have had lockup issues have certainly started off by you know, starting notes without any tongue, starting notes with just an air attack and just going, hum, and that certainly has value. But I think it's a question of where is the lockup issue? Is the lockup issue with a glottal stop or is the lockup issue actually at the tongue? And I think it could be either of those locations. The challenge with brass playing is that while string players, you can see if someone is, you know, moving their hand in, a, in an awkward way for vibrato or change their bow technique, at most of what we do playing is internal. So as teachers, our job is a lot less to teach our students, or as players, a lot less to teach people, and a lot more to allow them to learn and to facilitate their learning. So if I would have a player that came up with this issue, Honestly, I would think about it some before giving any kind of any kind of solid answer, but I would go about it in a way that would help them learn and hopefully as, as, uh, give a certain amount of strangeness to the experience so that they could figure out what it is that they're doing that's causing them to lock up and to develop a new habit where they approach things from a different way. So I wish I could give a, a, a better answer than that, but you're right, it's a very, very common issue in trombone, and it's it's something... I absolutely want to be able to help people with. Other questions? There was, uh, was, was uh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, could you talk about your transition from major tenor orchestral player to bass drum on your concepts and approach and so forth? Sure. The question is, could I talk about my transition from uh, being a tenor player in a, major, in, in a major position to being a bass player in a major position? A lot of it boiled down to when one of the things that when I played associate that I had the opportunity to do was to cover on the bass trombone part for the times that Don Harwood was off. Sometimes he was sick, sometimes he was off, uh, sometimes he got stuck in an ice storm. And it's for those reasons that I got a chance to play um, Shostakovich 8, with no rehearsal, uh, Ein Heldenleben with no rehearsal, on a horn I'd never played before. Uh, you know, had one of those, uh, you know, they, they say as an orchestral trombonist, you're either bored to death or scared to death sometimes. Uh, I had a few scared to death moments on bass trombone, that's for sure. But my transition period was really, the hardest thing was a couple of things. First of all, in, when I say I was blowing like a tenor, I was blowing for a tube of a certain bore size. I really think it's easier to go, the one caveat I didn't say about the, between alto and tenor and tenor and bass, it's easier to go from larger to smaller. Our sound is generally gonna tend to get kind of pinched, but then we'll learn how to get breadth 
out of it. Um, it is harder to go from a smaller board size to a larger, and I experienced that with contrabass when I played contrabass. My experience was to spend a lot of time um, trying to get a chord of the sound and a chord of the sound, but also a body to the sound. When I first started playing, I'd play piano or mezzo piano, and I'd have this sort of kind of quality. I know, really attractive, right? And then, but when I go loud, I get this because it would get really bright, and I missed really getting the center of the note. Um, and but as I spent time, more time on bass, I wound up blowing it, shall we say, more naturally. I would say that my body made adjustments more than I made adjustments. And just like, you know, if you're used to riding a, uh, I don't know, if you're used to riding a certain kind of bike or if you're used to driving a certain kind of car that has an accelerator to brake one way, you get in the other car. You don't necessarily actively think, all right, I'm going to drive this car differently than the last car. You just drive. And you learn over the process of driving what you have to do differently. Maybe one car has a heavier accelerator and one car, the brake you really got to press down on and the other car you can ease up. I allowed my body to make the changes, but what it involved was a lot of you know, etude playing, a lot of scale playing, a lot of arpeggio playing, a lot of getting comfortable with where notes were in the valve. Because the bass trombone, the, the positions are different than they are in tenor. And if I ever pull out someone's tenor now, I, it's, the intonation ain't pretty. And it's just because I'm not used to placing the slide in the places that it needs to go. I'm used to placing them where it goes on, on bass. So it was more, it was just about actually just playing the instrument and letting my body figure things out. And you know that, that meant a lot. It just meant allowing my body to learn. Other questions? Uh, the question is, do I find with the internet that students become more self-focused or more passive with lessons? That's a really good question. And I would say that you know, the internet is a dual-edged sword because you can get a lot of information on the internet and therefore you can waste a lot of time just getting information on the internet <laughs> where what you really need to do is be sitting in the horn and practicing because it's sitting in the practice room and practicing, because so much of what we do is actually learning how to operate this mechanical device to make musical statements. Um, so I think students, I've seen students find certain tools useful if they use them as tools and if they don't spend too much time. Um, I've actually adopted a strategy now, um, which I learned from someone very close to me, about practicing with a timer. And this particular person that I know of, when they practice uh, and they pull out, you know, they pull out their instrument, they might noodle around, fart around for a while, and then they start the timer and do their scales. And they do 10 minutes of scales, and then they turn the timer off, then they noodle around, take a break, whatever. And they do 120 time minutes. And it takes them about three to three and a half hours to get that time done. So now most of us might consider that and say, well, that's three hours of practicing, not this person. This person says that's 120 minutes. I've actually taken that. You know what it meant for me? It meant my 20 minute warm up takes six minutes. So I learned something about myself and about efficiency of time by actually using a timer. So I know it's sort of a little bit of a meandering answer, but that's, that's where I come from. That allows me to keep focused because the internet is a, it can be a tremendous time burner if you want it to be. So there was a question over here. Yeah. Brush, bum 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 number three or whatever. So, would you have them practicing doing the uh, glottal stop on each of those notes? I just wonder if you could elaborate a little well, bit more. Well, yeah, let me elaborate on this. Absolutely, I don't try to teach my students to do a glottal stop. I allow them to discover that they use it, if that makes sense. And I don't try to avoid it. And the way I do that is by encouraging people to play technical etudes or any kind of repeated note passage without tongue. But in doing so, rather than approaching it ha, 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 approaching ah, 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 ah. And when we say the vowel sound ah, we're actually putting a little glottal stop on. And when I encourage them to do that and go ah, 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 what it winds up is, is uh, this kind of sound. And 
And if they're not using their air well, air well, you will hear it right away because all of a sudden there's no tongue, there's no tongue noise, and you get to see what their airflow is actually like. And if their airflow is poor, you'll hear it right away, and they'll hear it right away. And when you ask them to actually get body on the notes, then they'll say, oh, I gotta use my air differently. So it's not something I necessarily okay. actively go out and say, you need to try to make that happen, unless I have older students, and I've had older students who don't use a glottal stop on their attacks, on their releases, and they tongue stop, and they don't realize that they're tongue stop, mm -hmm. and they've gone through years of people telling them, you need to work on your articulations, because your articulations aren't clean. Mm -hmm. And what the issue really is, is not the articulation, it's the release. And so once they learn that, usually by having them whistle, what that feels like, then they do it on the instrument, and then they learn a different kind of approach. So, so if follow up, if I could, um, when you do ah ah ah, isn't the glottal stroke happening at the beginning of the note and not the end? That's a very good point, and and the because the challenge with that approach, the the what that changes is the only change that I would make to that approach is to go ha on the first one, ha ah 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 ah. But to allow the glottis to actually release. When I articulate notes, repeated notes, I actually keep the glottis. My glottis stays engaged because that pre-pressurizes the air and it allows me to use a very, very light tongue. Students who I find have a very explosive tongue usually aren't engaging here. And so if we go adding tongue, it becomes creates this kind of sound. Whereas if I don't use it at all, the tongue can be a lot more explosive. And it just sounds like there's more pressure, more, more feedback that way. So it's a good question. I know, I know it's, it's strange and different. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Yes. You uh, talked about the problems that you'd had uh, with high and soft. Yes. Uh, did you solve that with any of the things you've talked about today, or can you talk about what? I can absolutely it? talk about that. I solved that because I was, I didn't realize that I was digging into my top whip a little bit. My older embouchure, my embouchure pre 2006, I anchored on my top whip and rested the bottom of the mouthpiece wherever it went on my bottom whip. But I anchored on my top, and I set basically top to bottom. And with the change that I made in 2006, I set the bottom whip, or the, the uh, mouthpiece, at, the, at what I said, the junction of the red and the white on my lip here, and I anchored on the bottom and instead pivoted the mouthpiece up. And it might not look like a big difference from here to here, but it meant the world a difference for me because I went from playing 12 performances of Brahms one in a row, either chipping or blanking or missing a note, to having four performances in a row where it felt like it was the easiest thing in the world. Well, if there are no further questions, I thank you all for being such a great audience. And uh, thank you for coming. And happy practicing. Enjoy the rest of your time at the festival.